Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. Welcome to Prison Professors. I am Michael Santos, and today I am thrilled to be introducing you to Mark Olmsted. Now, everybody who goes into the criminal justice system has a story, and I believe we can learn from everybody who has gone and, and overcome the struggle and trauma of being arrested, of having to go through the indignities of incarceration. And we can learn from them. I know that I can learn from Mark. He's got a unique story that uh, I think will be applicable to anybody who listens. So, Mark, welcome to Prison Professors. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story with us, and it would be very helpful for us if you could just give us some background into your life story. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'm so glad to be uh, on your podcast. Um, The wrinkle in my story, I mean, the big wrinkle is that, um, uh, you know, I came from a very educated, loving family. There was just nothing in my background that is typical to the stereotype of, 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 of who ends up in prison. But uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, I, uh, Sarah conver- I Sarah converted to HIV, I'm an openly gay man. And um, uh, around 1991, everybody, all my friends started dying, including my uh, uh, brother, uh, my gay brother, who I was very close to. And... Uh, It began a sort of, I went on disability and it began, uh, and and I I, I developed an addiction to crystal meth because I really, my life had just become totally upended. I stopped working and uh, I eventually found that I needed to find a way to support my addiction, which became quite severe. And I turned it to drug dealing. And uh, I, may I ask you, let me interrupt for a second. Had you had any experience prior to becoming a drug dealer with the criminal justice system? None at all. And how old were you when this happened? Uh, this uh, I, I was it was late. I wasn't until uh, I was uh, uh, 40 that I became a dealer. So you and I went in, into prison at 44. So what kind of life were you living prior to crossing the line and getting involved in drug trafficking? Uh, I had a very, uh, you know, I went to college and I was a screenwriter and I was pursuing my screenwriting career in L.A. and I was working uh, various office jobs and as an editor and a translator. And uh, when I became sick myself uh, enough to be hospitalized and uh, I stopped working in 1993 and I was still pursuing my writing, but you know, I was undergoing a major loss of a close friend about every two or three months uh, for about uh, five years. Uh, and I'm sorry to hear that. And that's that's what pushed yeah. you down the path to uh, drug addiction and eventually into the world of, of drug trafficking. Is that you right? You know, I might have become a drug addict anyway because, you know, I, I had a, a, a party boy in me for sure. But uh, I don't think... Uh, I, I would have become uh, one. Of, uh, I had a psychology where consequences were for other people because I was going to die. And every two, I had a two month time limit and everyone was dying around me. And I had a diagnosis that was pretty dire. And I just did not expect to live. And, and, and meth is a great drug for that psychology of needing to live in the present and forget the, the future. And, um, uh, you know, and and by the time the AIDS meds came online, where it was suddenly curable, my addiction was already you know way past you know understood. Uh, and I and I often say you know uh, that prison because I had so many opportunities to 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 get sober and to get out of that life. And I I, I often say that in retrospect, um, prison was the closest I could get to dying without really dying. And how. Because 
And how yeah. um, so how long did it take before you got sucked into the criminal justice system? Uh, so I started dealing very soon after 2000 or something, and my arrest was in uh, August of uh, 2003. Uh, I got a kind of slap on the wrist, but uh, I, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had probation and community service. And uh, I, I could have if I'd gotten just gotten out of the dealing, but I was a very good dealer and people kept coming back to me and I couldn't resist, you know, just the fast cash. And I started dealing again and and they arrested me again. And uh, this time they said, you know, you're going to to uh, uh, you're going down with the big boys said my pro, pro, uh, uh, probation officer. And uh, I got 16 months uh, with half time. I did nine months altogether. So it's still compared to 26 years or or a, a lot of the things that a lot of the sentences I could have gotten. I was still very lucky. But well, it was you know, yeah, that, that's I think that it's 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 not really relative to what one person gets. Anytime somebody's going into the criminal justice system, it can be traumatic and it can be life altering and life changing, particularly for a, per, somebody who has struggles with HIV and is openly gay, as you said. Can you yeah, tell? that was that was the, the that was one of the toughest parts of prison. You know, I mean, already as a as an educated person, you're suspicious uh, in prison. You know, you sound like their teachers or, or the judges, and 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 you don't really fit in. And as an openly gay man, you have to be very very careful about how open you are about it. And then when they when they find out you're positive, also there there was so there was so much rumor and misinformation in prison. This was in 2004 that I I uh, you know I had some I had some risky moments that. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 in the book that I wrote about the experience, I said, you know, I, I discovered that creativity is one of the best survival tools there is. And, and, and I wrote my way through the experience. Did you, when you went into the criminal justice system, could you tell our audience a little bit about the type of environment you went into? Were you in a county jail, a high security prison? Where did they lock you up? Well, first I started in county jail, and I was very lucky because in uh, L.A., uh, after a few harrowing days where you spend a, a lot of time in um, these uh, t- holding tanks that are hopelessly overcrowded, uh, and I was probably exposed to tuberculosis uh, in, in one of them because I had to be treated for that later on, um, uh, I, they do have gay dorms at, in, in Los Angeles County, so – uh, they're much safer than Gen Pop. In fact, there's a lot of uh, 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 straight men pretending it because they'd rather do their time there. Uh, th- they can have their, quote, girlfriends, which are, uh, you know, m- male. Uh, we, we're not supposed to say trannies anymore. That's what we call them there. Uh, but uh, uh, and it's much safer. So, there, you know, there's three dorms. One is 5,100, 5,200, and 5,300. And 5,100 was by far the safest. And, you know, and then if you had infractions, they bump you down to 5,200 or 5,300, which we call Thunderdome, which was really not a place that you want to do your time gay or straight. Uh, uh, so I was there for a month and a half in which uh, while how, I waited. How does one to- go from – from being identified. Tell us a little bit about the process that somebody would go through that they may be put in one of those segregated dorms that you described. Well, you announce at intake that you say I'm gay and then they send you to the K-11. Uh, it's the, called K-11 and they send you to the uh, officers, the two officers who do intake and they ask you a bunch of questions to make sure you're really gay. Like they ask you for a list of gay bars and, uh, uh, and I flashed with I, I passed with flying colors. I, and unfortunately for me, uh, when they first did the, the other psychiatric intake, I told them that they said, do you have any suicidal thoughts? And I thought, you know, this is going to look, look good to the judge if I say yes. He might be more likely to send me to rehab or counseling. And instead, <laughs> I wasn't suicidal. I mean, I was very unhappy. I was coming down, and I was in a state of shock. Uh, but, uh, but, but I got in suicide lockdown for uh, seven days, and which, and that's that's you. You want to do a quick 
and and complete lockdown, a uh, complete bottom. That was it. You know, they don't give you a toothbrush even. They don't. Uh, you have to ring to just get uh, toilet paper, and there's nothing to do. Uh, Absolutely nothing to do, but but you know, in retrospect, it, it was a, a sort of a cleansing week for me, where I really, be, I you know, I sobered up and I started to realize that I had to, I had to make this the beginning of a complete uh, change in my life. Interesting. So so when you went into the Los Angeles County Jail system, first mm-hmm. of all, you had to declare your orientation, your sexual orientation, which could potentially result in you going to a safer dorm, but Mm -hmm. thinking that you may be able to influence the judge in some way by saying you're suicidal, you end up putting yourself in an even more restrictive environment. Yeah, but you were were at least alone, so you were safe, but but there was nothing to do, and they had taken my glasses, so I couldn't even see the TV, which I couldn't even hear anyway. So I just sort of entertained and talked to myself for you know, uh, seven days. And at the end of that, I was able to convince the psychiatrist that I was fine. Uh, You know, she could send me out. And then I went to the gay dorms and which was for me, was like um, uh, heaven because I could order food. And, uh, uh, I knew a few people, uh, some of my Confederates in there and I was able to make a semblance of friends and, you know, the food was terrible and, but uh, the gay dorms were, you know, it was, it wasn't a terrible, place to do time did you learn about the prison the jail environment from those other people who were locked in that same dorm as you yes i did get a i i i you know i have a, a few characters that i that appear in my book uh uh scraggly tooth and uh mr mr skinny <laughs> who were uh two two young guys who, who who i kept feeding them you know they gave the hiv positive extra uh, lunches and some of these guys were very hungry and didn't get enough to eat. So I would I would give them my extra food and they would tell me about what to expect on the main line. So they, I got my little, uh, you know, uh, education. Uh, yeah, my little education. And so then and, eventually you transferred to a state prison to serve your time or did you do it all in the jail there? No, I, I did a month and a half in jail. Then I did uh, eight weeks in Delano, which is that reception center where you're mixed with all different levels and there it's very restrictive and um you, you know that's and then you wait for your permanent assignment could you tell us about that that reception center whether there was a similar type of classification system for protective reasons that separated gay people from straight people where there could be not no not at Delano, not at the reception center. You and, were, and did they, you find any type of predatory behavior or feel threatened at all? Yes, or could you talk certain, to us about that? There's a certain young man named Chainsaw who was really the uh, uh, bane of my existence. Who, who who decided that it was it was uh, his uh, role in life to figure out if I was gay, so he could protect me supposedly from the from the latinos and the blacks who supposedly wanted to know and the fact was that uh, the only the only hassles i ever got were from other whites and uh, so uh, uh but you know the thing about delano was that everyone uh, you know a uh, 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 12 percent of the of the population left every week to go to the main line so everything kept shifting so i did make close friends with a Romanian hitman named Thumper, who, um, who, uh, was kind of my protector. And, uh, you know, although, although he was straight, I, you know, you would have thought that there was quite a weird romantic undercurrent. So he kind of saved my ass, but I did have an encounter with Chainsaw at the end that came very, very close to, to getting violent. And, uh, he didn't like that I stood up to him. But uh, I had made enough friends because I, I made friends quickly with 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 uh, uh, by thinking on my feet and and using my writing skills. You know, I, I, I wrote for uh, letters to girlfriends back home for some of these guys who, you know, I'd write love poetry for them. And uh, Loco was one Latin gang member who who had heard that I had written a, a poet, poem for someone else and then. I wrote a poem for him, and then I started writing to his girlfriend for him, like Cyrano de Bergerac, because he had no idea how to communicate with her. 
<laughs> and it was it was very funny. Um, there's always a there's always a market for an educated man, regardless of where he goes, even if it's in jail or prison. And you seem to have found your way. So so what eventually eventually which prison did you go to? So then after sentence? Delano, I was I was uh, uh, sent to Chino, which had was one of the four uh, facilities that have medical facilities for HIV specialty. You know, uh, uh, and. As soon as I got there, they, it was just so overcrowded. They sent me to uh, a, 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 a Sycamore, uh, a, which is which the a Stickamore is the is the is the uh, name inside prison for it. And I was with an Aryan supremacist, uh, Aryan gang member in a, a cell for a week, and that got very hairy as he discovered that I was probably gay. And I managed to get transferred out of that into. Uh, uh, protective custody. So I was in Birch Hall at Chino for six weeks, which was like a gay dorm. And um, uh, but there were there was transvestites and and transgendered and older men also there. And after six weeks there, but it was super super overcrowded. But it was at least safe. I finally got to uh, Redwood Hall, which was the dorm, the minimum security dorm in Chino, where I spent my last four months. And um, and that was. Did you have a perception that as a gay man in prison, you struggled more than a straight person would? Or did you? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. You 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 you. There's so much misinformation. And, you know, the the whole psychology of like, you know, never eat after a black person or never eat after a Latino. It was the same thing. Never eat after a gay. So uh, they 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 considered it very important to identify that whether you you were gay or not so that everyone knew not to eat after you or to share food or anything like that, because being gay, uh, I, I thought it was HIV paranoia, but but it turns out that that at least in 2004, there was a, a lot of a sense that that being gay itself was um, uh, uh, transmissible. You know, how, you does, how does that could you help us, our audience, understand what you meant by what you just said? Never eat after a certain person. Walk that so walk us you, through that. Yeah, it's very, very racialized, at least when I in 2004, I, I don't think it's changed much in the prison culture. And, you know, whites within whites, it's like you could you could hand your half an orange to a black guy if you, uh, that was frowned upon. But whatever you couldn't do, you couldn't receive any food from uh, someone from another race, particularly blacks, if they maybe had touched it with their lips or it eaten it from it. Uh, cigarettes, the same thing. We, we You could still smoke there in uh, 20, 2004. So I bought a lot of tobacco and rolled it and we couldn't sell any of the, of the, of the cigarettes we made until we discovered that because we were licking them because I had a, I got, I found a gay bunkie and it was, you know, uh, we, we were kind of a little, duo. Um, and then, so Jimmy, who was the head of the whites who became my protector and a close friend, uh, uh, started licking them for us. And then we were able to sell all of our cigarettes. <laughs> so it, how about staff? Did you have any challenges from staff? Um, I did, uh, uh, you know, Miss Wade was, uh, she, she just, uh, she just frowned on us and she was she was just like, you know, you, you're you, you're 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 getting a little too big for your britches. You know, she wasn't she wasn't used to it. But um, so like one of the challenges I had is that I, 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 I couldn't get the clippers use of the clippers until I got approval from all the three groups that it was all right, because, you know, but I had spent a lot of time educating people that they weren't going to get a, a, a HIV because we shared the clippers, you know. Because they cut my hair with them. You, but you were able to get through the nine months, it sounds like, without – I mean, you, you're having to make – use your critical thinking skills and figure out ways to maneuver the challenges of imprisonment. What advice would you give to somebody else who's going inside that doesn't consider himself criminogenic and wants to come out whole? What what advice might you offer to that person? Well, I then you know the the big twist in my story is that my sister who uh, was extremely supportive and uh, uh, she said you know you know I wrote I wrote I wrote I wrote incredible amounts of letters I was always a writer and I got incredible amounts of letters 
everyone was very jealous. Uh, but my sister was very smart to send a, a, a stationery for everybody and pencils for everybody. So I was very generous with all this stuff. And so I, I, I you know, in my, I had a lot of coffee. I had a lot of uh, uh, money in my accounts. So I was very generous with everything I had. And it is, a, you know, I was able to buy, quote, protection. But um, what happened is that she said, after three months, she said, you know, your letters are so good, I'm going to put them in a blog. And she started blogging my letters in real time and putting them on the blog so people could follow my experience. And when the word spread that everyone wanted to be in the blog. And so these wild sort of short stories would just crop up every day. And now I'm a writer and everyone's not a writer and, 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 and very few people would have a sister who would write a blog, uh, put a, type their letters up on a blog. But I did find that the process of being writing about my experience on a daily basis uh, and observing everything around me acutely was a great way to learn how to live in the present moment again, which is a skill I had lost to drug addiction. And I would recommend that to anybody who is going through it and is thinking constantly about when they'll get out, when they'll get out, when they'll get out, which is impossible not to fantasize about, but to just say, I'm here right now, so how can I be 100% present to my experience? And as most of us know, is that other prisoners uh, generally don't come from environments where they were listened to very much. So just a willingness to listen and to pay attention and to honor the stories of a lot of men who are generally have led faceless lives or, or, or lives where they haven't gotten a lot of feed, acknowledgement and feedback and listening to their stories, in my case, writing them down and transmitting them to the outside world was, um, it was very good for me because I learned how to, uh, if you can, if you can get sober and stay sober and be in the present moment in prison, then you can pretty much do it anywhere. That's you know? good advice about writing. It's very therapeutic. It certainly helped get me through a quarter century of imprisonment. And, and I would agree with you. Anybody who can develop that skill set is going to not only be able to cope with the struggles and challenges of being separated from the people we love, but it's also going to help an individual develop a skill that he may be able to use when he comes home to, to launch his career. And we're talking to Mark Ol. Olmsted, is that right? Ol- Olmsted? Olmsted. Olmsted. Olmsted, who is the author of Ink from the Pen, which is a pretty clever title, I think. It's a prison memoir, and you can get it available on uh, on uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, but also at his website, which is lavenderisthenewblack.com, and I encourage anybody to read it. I have read through the first uh, opening pages of this document, and he's, I can verify that he is an exceptional writer. He's brings his characters to life, and I would encourage anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about Mark Olmsted to pick up their copy of the book, Ink from the Pen. But Mark, we're coming to the end of this episode, and I've got a, another question for you. How has your criminal conviction, you were only in prison for nine months, but you do have a felony conviction. You've been out now for more than a decade. Could you tell our audience a little bit about what they may expect if, if your story is is a you know, as a template or a pattern, what can they expect as far as how their criminal record is going to follow them for the rest of their lives? Well, thank God we have banned the box now. And I think uh, uh, it, 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 it's it's getting easier and easier uh, to, especially with, with, if you put some time between your conviction and you. Un- unfortunately, for me or and for society at large, you know, I'm kind of a born teacher. And I really, you know, I speak You're several times. What? Yes. A born teacher. A born teacher. Okay, thanks. And, you know, I would have been willing to go into the worst uh, schools uh, in the worst neighborhoods of LA, and I think I would have been a very good candidate for imparting a lot of my experience. You know, I don't come off as very streetwise, but in fact, in fact, you know, uh, and and I could have re- reached a lot of the kids who are most at risk, but. That's I, I'm on. I'm convicted of one of the three or four things that that they say we don't care. Ban the box in a way. If you've been convicted of drug manufacture, uh, you know, of drug sales of narcotics, you cannot teach. Uh, community college, you can. So I got a master's, but uh, you know, being an adjunct professor is is very very 
it's getting harder and harder and I'm getting older and older. And, you know, what um, are you doing for a living now? So I have uh, I, I I had disability before I went in and I've partially continued that. Thank God. But that's just a core. It's not enough. I sub I edit subtitles for a living and I translate. So I get I get uh, a sub uh, translations into English of subtitles from other languages and I edit them and make them perfectly fluent and fluid and I identify mistranslations and I, you know, so I subtitle film. So it's a great job that I absolutely adore. And, you know, I happen to have been raised by a French mother. And, uh, uh so I had these language skills, uh, and, and, and that my employer, you know, didn't care at all about my prison experience. She's found, she finds it rather fascinating. Um, it's all in how you spin it, Mark, and you found a way to spin it and build it, live a life of meaning and relevance. Mm -hmm. I applaud you for being able to get through the criminal justice system and, and restore your life. And I, and I want to thank you for sharing uh, a harrowing experience with our audience, many of whom are going through the same process right now. So it's, I'm very grateful to you for taking this time, but we've come to the end of this episode. Do you have any final words of wisdom that you might want to share with people who are either going into the criminal justice system or maybe in there right now, other than that great advice of picking up a pen and learning how to translate that ink into uh, something memorable. Yeah, well, that, that, that uh, willingness to pay attention uh, to your environment and to realize that there's a lot of life going on right around you and a lot of men are in pain and they... they, they just listening to them, paying attention to them, and refusing de- to dehumanize uh, the, the people around you that uh, that uh, are, are are used to it, and you know it can start there. Uh, I mean, I, I I developed some credible friendships where or links between uh, across racial races because as a gay man, they gave me a, a different set of rules to apply to, and so just think strategically but creatively you can even think creatively in prison and there's a lot of I, I came up with a lot of creative solutions to some very thorny moments thank you very much for sharing your story I am Michael with Prison Professors on behalf of my partner Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni I want to thank you for listening if you'd like show notes please visit us at prisonprofessors.com or text the word prison pro to 44222 and you can get some information on how we may be able to help you thank you we'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring guest